share. All right, it is six o'clock. All right. Well, first of all, I just want to say welcome, everyone. Uh, it is so, so good to see you all here tonight. Um, I am Trinity Lorino. I am executive director of Lakeland Now. And if you are a Lakeland Now reader, you may know we are an independent nonprofit newsroom dedicated to providing Lakeland with free and easily accessible local news. So you might ask yourself, why is a digital publisher of local news hosting a live forum about growth? And believe me, I've asked myself that question a couple of times over the last few months as well. Um, but the truth is, the answer to that is really, really clear. We are a mission-driven organization, and our mission is to foster community engagement and civic participation. So you all being here tonight, this is the proof concept of our mission. This you here is how we measure our impact. So thank you all so much for being here and engaging in this conversation. So this is our second foray into an issues driven uh, uh, forum like this. We did one on housing and, and homelessness back in March. And sometimes we find that there are just topics that are so big and so complex that they kind of transcend just the news cycle and they're really crying out for these bigger, broader kind of conversations. We know we can't possibly cover every single issue um, and nuance related to growth in Lakeland in a single night, but what we hope to do is start a really healthy dialogue, one that really increases the transparency and accountability of how decisions are made within our city and also one that recognizes the humanity and the commitment to the community that everybody in this room and everyone watching on our live feed shares. Um, so before we get to the meat of the matter, there are some people that I really have to thank um, because putting together an evening like this is, is no simple task. Um, and it certainly wouldn't happen without a lot of support along the way. So this event would not be possible without the partnership with Lakeland Vision. And I will be turning it over to Laura Rodriguez, Executive Director of Lakeland Vision, in just a moment. But this has been a really wonderful partnership, and I'm so glad to have their help and their support. I also really want to thank each of our panelists um, who are donating, volunteering their time and their expertise tonight um, to be with you all. And I want to thank Dr. Sally Stone, um, the founder of The Well and this space. <laughs> this amazing. Um, wonderful space that we're in and I want to thank James uh, Kessler from Ultra Production Group that is handling our live stream for, for us and some other people that I really do have to thank um, First Revolution Marketing uh, they gave us a really really generous um, support both financially and with um, in-kind support uh, they are they produce the videos for all of our for our panelists coming into this event um, so thank you guys very much and uh, Lakeland Electric and, um, and Borum, Fire, uh, Borum Fire Protection are also our fiscal sponsors tonight. And their financial support really helps us to cover the cost of these events, helping to ensure that we can, like our reporting, keep it as free and open and accessible to all Lakelanders as possible. So lastly, if you guys want to support the journalism and the work of Lakeland Now, you can always become a member. Um, you can join our, on our website at lkldnow.com. And you can also join us for our benefit concert that's going to be happening November 10th at Union Hall. Um, it's a, it'll be a really fun night that's featuring a lot of uh, local uh, live bands. Um, and it kicks off a fundraising period for us known as Newsmatch, in which every local donation is matched by a coalition of national funders, and it really does help support the work that we do. Um, so with that, let me now turn this over to Laura to tell you a little bit about uh, Lakeland Vision and the structure for tonight. Good evening. As Trinity mentioned, I am Laura Rodriguez. I'm the executive director of Lakeland Vision. And um, for any of you all who may not be familiar with Lakeland Vision, um, we are not an eye doctor. We are actually um, an organization that does citizen-driven visioning for our community, which is long-term strategic planning for a better Lakeland. Um, just a little bit of background that we were founded in 1998 with the goal of creating citizen-driven long-range strategic plan for the metro Lakeland area. That means, you know, all of Lakeland, greater Lakeland, not just within the city limits. 
um, our organization identifies community weaknesses and strengths in order to implement this comprehensive um, action-oriented plan for the future of our city. And um, we've actually had three visioning efforts over the course of our 22, 24 years now, um, in 1998, 2008, and um, 2019. And we are currently in the early phases of implementing this third generation vision. And um, after, you know, familiar with our vision, we have um, four focus areas that include strong and safe neighborhoods, education um, for education for a lifetime, um, we have an economy, um, and activities for a diverse community. And um, all of those things are heavily affected by growth in our community. So that's why this is really important for Lakeland Vision to continue the conversation. We have dedicated this upcoming year, our board, in exploring growth and its effects on Lakeland. Um, and we're excited to go forward with what Lakeland Vision does best, which is citizen input. So the second half of our evening, we will be breaking out after the intermission, after the panel discussion, to um, small groups. And we really hope that you all would stay and plug in and give us um, feedback on what's discussed this evening, your own ideas, and we look forward to compiling that and analyzing that data and help us, um, you know, affect some, you know, change and have that citizen voice in, in moving forward. So um, please stay with us after the panel. And um, thank you so much. And we are thrilled to have this partnership with Lakeland now. All right, and uh, one last note before we do get started here. Um, one more person I actually need to thank is, of course, our founder, Barry Friedman, um, who is, yes. <laughs> the vision behind Lakeland now. Um, and he is also the one who will be watching the comments on the live stream. So if you have any questions that you'd like to submit from the live stream, he's there, he is on it. And with that, I'd like to introduce a Lakeland now contributor and veteran broadcaster, Andrea Oliver, who will be our moderator for this evening. We are headed in the right direction. There it is, I think I just got turned on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Andrea Oliver, and it is my distinct honor to lead this conversation tonight with an estimated uh, time, I think, of about a, an hour to chat a little bit. I have an esteemed panel here with me that will offer insight on a, a series of questions. And at this time, I'd like to present to you our panelists for this evening. I'm going to ask because I have uh, information here and it's not in any particular order. So as I call your name and I start to share a little bit about you, if you'd kind of just wave and smile at our audience, that would be nice. Sitting right in the center of uh, the group tonight is Sarah Roberts McCarley. She serves as a Lakeland City Commissioner and is founder and chairman of the Randy Roberts Foundation that works to cultivate Florida's future leaders through civic engagement and public service. 
Prior to founding the Randy Roberts Foundation in 2009, Sarah worked as part of a global, national, and local nonprofit organizations, including Pope Vision, Best Buddies International, Lakeland Regional Medical Center Foundation, and consulted on projects for the Polk County Farm Bureau, Peace River Center, and Florida 4-H. Her career in philanthropy and public service spans more than 25 years, despite the youthful look, I might add. Sarah is an active board member in many community organizations to include the Lakeland Vision Board, Lakeland Area Mass Transit, and the Citrus Connection. She earned her degree in mass communication from Florida Southern College in Lakeland. She's married to Trey McCarley, and together they're raising Charlotte and Samuel Roberts. Thank you so much for being here. Gary Ralston, there he is. <laughs> He's the managing partner of SV and Saunders Ralston Dantzler Real Estate, the premier commercial services provider in Central Florida and Polk County. He's a recognized subject matter expert in retail and commercial properties. In addition, Mr. Ralston serves as a successful real estate developer, investor, and group investment sponsor He's an adjunct faculty member at several colleges and universities, including at Florida Southern College, where he chairs the Florida Southern College Real Estate Conference. He holds a master's in real estate and construction management from the Franklin L. Burns School of Real Estate and Construction Management at the University of Denver. Mr. Ralston, thank you for being here. Carol Phillipson, there she is is a graduate of Newcomb College and Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She's been enrolled in healthcare consulting nationally and as a hospital exec in places such as New Orleans, in Lakeland, and in Tampa. She has lived in Lakeland since 1996 and has served on a number of city, county, and nonprofit boards, as well as at USF and USF Lakeland Poly. Carol, thank you for being here. Mr. Rick Maxey, there he is. He has more than 30 years of experience working in Florida government. Oh, by the way, did we tell you you were gonna be tested on this afternoon? <laughs> he is recently retired as the Assistant Vice President of Office of Diversity and Inclusion at Florida Polytech. Prior to working with Florida Poly, Mr. Maxey served as Executive Director for Government Relations at Florida State University System Board of Governors. He acted as the lead legislative and executive advocate for the State University System of Florida from 2005 to 2011, and later became director of government relations at Florida Lambda Rail, a fiber optic company serving educational and research entities in Florida. In addition to his work in the educational field, Mr. Max has served for more than a decade in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in various capacities, including the professional development of 25,000 employees in Florida's prison system. He's been married since 1985. I believe his beautiful wife is sitting back there. There she is, she's waving, and they have two daughters. Brian Ruiz. Oh, by the way, Mr. Maxi, thank you for being here. Mr. Rose has spent the past 28 years serving local governments in Central Florida. Since 2003, he has served the City of Lakeland in roles including Neighborhood Services Manager and Community Invest, Invest, Improvement Manager. Since late 2021, he has been the Director of Community and Economic Development. As Director, Brian is responsible for the department's delivery of key quality of life services, including long-range planning and development review, multimodal transportation planning, historic preservation, neighborhood outreach, community redevelopment, building inspection, code enforcement, and affordable housing. He's going to be getting a lot of the questions. <laughs> A fourth generation Central Floridian, Brian is a graduate of Warner University, Florida State University's Certified Public Manager Program, and the University of South Florida's Community Real Estate Development Program. Thank you for being here, Mr. Ruiz. I apologize. No. <laughs> Scott Bishop is our next panelist, Manager of Emerging Technology at Lakeland Electric. 
Scott responsibilities include leading the business strategy for electrification across the Lakeland Electric Service territory. He develops business and strategic planning for continuity teams to tackle carbon messaging and next generation fleet. Leads project for utility scale solar installations, RFP creation and purchase power agreements as well as advanced grid technologies. That's just like saying physics to me. <laughs> and Mr. Brad Lunds, there he is. Oh, thank you so much for being here, sir. Mr. Lunds. Brad Lunds is president of the Lunds Group, a company he has been affiliated with since 2008. He has over 15 years experience ranging from large commercial resorts development to higher education facility design. He's a registered architect in the state of Florida and Texas and a member of the Tampa Bay American Institute of Architects. Brad became a leadership in energy and environmental design accredited professional in 2006 and assisted with the lead design for St. Leo University School of Business. He became a Green Glows professional in 2013. Brad has been published in the bilingual English and Mandarin trade magazine network issue 31. His article on collaborative spaces addressed the need for flexible community spaces to foster informal relationships, interpersonal connections, and the exchange of ideas. Brad has a breadth of experience in resolving client spatial and budgetary requirements while delivering a quality and creative design. As you can see, we have a wide ranging group of very experienced and very capable panelists to join us tonight. Are you ready, ladies and gentlemen? So in my business in news, there is a saying we use, Barry's going to be very familiar with the saying, it says, if it bleeds, it leads. Well, our Lakeland Now uh, readers are much more sophisticated and are interested in much more articles and things than things that just bleed. When we write about new apartments, subdivisions, or large businesses, we usually get a lot of responses from residents who want to stop all growth or they want to wait until we have adequate roads, schools, and other infrastructure until we allow more growth. Is there a flaw with that position? And how do we balance the desire of people to move here with providing the infrastructure to accommodate the growth? I think I'd like to start with Ms. McCarley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to answer that question. Mr. Ruiz is leering at me. To answer this question. So I think the challenge for Lakeland is where we are sitting in proximity to Tampa and Orlando um, and we are in a, the fastest growing state really in the Union right now. We have a lot of people who want to come here, who love our beaches, who love our weather, who love being near theme parks and they love having a great quality of life. So one of the struggles in balancing from a commission standpoint is how do we continue to approve varying land uses with what our community wants and, and, and thinks is most precious about our environment here and what we all love about Lakeland. So it's a constant battle in between choosing working with developers along with our residents to figure out what does work. When you talk about infrastructure, um, that is really the key to this, at least for my seat on commission right now, is looking at what we can handle and what we can't handle. Infrastructure costs a lot of money. I could bore you to death currently with how much a road costs, um, the engineering that goes into a road. And one of the things I like to say to people in the public is you need a road to work, correct? You, it's just like a surgeon. You want to make sure that when you're driving on a bridge into Tampa that it holds you up and it doesn't collapse and nothing bad happens. Just like when you go into a medical facility, you want a doctor who has the most experience and who can diagnose the problem and, and handle it really well for you and have a good outcome. The same thing happens with roads. So a lot goes into the building of roads and where we put it. It's not as simple as, hey, we need an extra lane here. You don't want to have eminent domain. We don't want to knock down historic buildings. There's a lot that goes into just the simplification of trying to build better roads. So do we ask our developers to pitch in and, and build new roads for us whenever there is a new area that's coming on board? And one of the other things that we'll talk about at length tonight is funding. 
You know, we are constantly battling funding. If we look at I-4 and State Road 33 currently, it backs up um, on the eastbound side to go north to Polk City and south down into um, the Lakeland area. Well, that takes money and it takes a legislature to approve it. So these are very complicated issues and it's not as simple as some of us would, would like to think. And I like to joke too when I speak publicly that we're trying to apply common sense to government and that's kind of an oxymoron. I mean, we're, we do things a little different in the United States of America where we have a lot of checks and balances and we want to make sure things are safe and we don't arbitrarily just go throw roads up or bridges or uh, landlines or electricity. So it's a, it's a convoluted issue and it's really difficult, but I think we do try to balance it. And, and so that, that's the question. Yes. How, how are we doing our, that balance? How are we creating that balance? I think that's the million dollar question, you know, for the room tonight. For us as electeds, we have to rely on our staff like Mr. Ruiz. We also mm -hmm. rely on people like Mr. Ralston that come in and talk to us when there are people who want to develop and we have to deal with property owner rights too. So if a property owner had a pasture that was historically for cows and citrus groves and it no longer can bear that, it can't be used for that anymore and the family can't afford to pay taxes on that property, then they are allowed to sell it to whom they choose. And if they sell it to a client of Mr. Ralston's and that person decides and the company decides to have um, build 100 houses there, then that's when it comes to the planning and zoning board. So it's a, it's a volume effect. And I think that's something that we're all here to discuss. And we probably have different, my view is very different probably from Mr. Ralston's as a developer. So I think, you know, that's what we're here to, to do. So I'll toss it to Gary if you want yes, to let him maybe absolutely. Well, talk about I was I was just about to do so. <laughs> Jim, I'm honored to follow in your footsteps, but you know, I, I think one of the issues that um, uh, people don't address, but could change things a lot for our quality of life, is the difference between where people live and where they work. The technical expression is called labor shed. So just maybe a quick show of hands. How many, I assume you all live in Lakeland, how many of you work outside Polk County? Hmm. Well, you're the minority, I have to tell you, based upon the Department of Economic Opportunity Analysis and their labor shed report from this year, 49.3% of the workers who reside in Polk County are employed outside the county. That, that means they don't work here. And they're not all in uh, uh, Orlando. About 42,000 of those are in Orange County, 27,000 in Hillsborough County. So the, the other side of the coin, which I think is distressing, is that we have um, about 90,000, actually 96,290 by their count, of people who work in Polk County but don't live here. And I think that's the biggest uh, uh, impact we have on quality of life. That's why the roads are congested. <laughs> you know, people driving to and from work. And the ramifications are terrible. Uh, if you have to drive an hour each day to work or more, you probably don't have time to go in and visit with your children at school. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, you may be too tired to help them with homework when they get home. So it, it's a big problem. And, and you're not involved in service organizations to help make this a better place to live. So m my suggestion is we all think about how we get more jobs here mm. so that people who live here can work here. Very Thank good. you. Thank you so much. I'm going to move on. We're going to be coming back to that issue. But um, not, not many years ago, Lakeland City Hall was seen as a barrier to growth. Developers complained about red tape and bureaucrats interpreting regulations very strictly. More recently, several city commissioners have run for office on platforms of getting to yes and more quickly. And city procedures have been streamlined. Has this pendulum swung too far the other way? And Mr. Luntz, I think I'm gonna, as a developer, I'm gonna have you address that issue. Well, that's kind of a tough one since I have things in front of city. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I will say there, that the phrase is often used uh, by developers who don't get what they want. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's too much red tape because they're not getting what they want. But at the same time, there is too much red tape in the wrong places. There are fiefdoms that exist within City Hall. There are people that hold power and don't let you get through certain things, and there's not a collaborative nature. Now, that being said, there are certain, there are certain pieces, like Brian 
Brian has a great building inspection department. They understand, uh, I'll, I'll use an example. Uh, Summit was a unique project. Uh, had, a, had a very interesting timeline, and if you've ever built a building, you normally do it all. You have the interior designed and the exterior. It's submitted simultaneously. Uh, this was one of the tallest structures. Fire is notorious. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's a, there's, a, there's a, a component where fire likes to do their own thing. Taylor was fantastic, worked with us. City department worked with us to get that done. Now, from the perspective of has it swung too far? No. In okay. some regards, yes. In other regards, it's a matter of just balancing. I think that leadership is starting to get it right. Um, there are some, some meetings just to have meetings, but that's, that's bureaucracy. But it's not, if you were to go into Orlando right now, it's taking four months to get a permit. If you're working city of Jacksonville, you have to hire someone that their full-time job is to expedite permits. This city is accessible. This city is working on transparency. This city is doing a great job. I am glad that it is my city. I don't like working in other jurisdictions because I'm so spoiled with the quality of Lakeland. Mm. So I don't think it's swung either way to answer your question. I think it's sitting in a very happy medium mm -hmm. with opportunities for growth. Uh, Mr. Ruiz, that should make you feel very good hearing that from a developer. I made note of it. <laughs> But of course, I, I have to ask you, because he talked about a balance. And so as you look at this issue from, from, from the place of, well, everything is too, it's not, it's not streamlined and there are too many red tapes to the, the issue of is it swinging too far the other day way, how do you determine that balance? Well, <clears throat> good evening. I've, I've dodged the mic, I guess, as long as possible. Um, really, uh, the answer to both questions is, is that we find that balance by listening to those that we serve. Mm -hmm. And it, no, everybody can't get their way, whether that's developer or individual members of the public that we would call stakeholders, but we listen to them. They elect commissioners like Sarah McCarley, who set the vision and set the policy and then set the staff about implementing that policy and they've done that mm -hmm. and and I don't know that it's for me to say whether the pendulum has swung too far one way or the other I think the public well, go ahead and say the, the public decides that yes. based on who they elect to the commission and the priorities that they communicate when electing those commissioners yeah mr. Bishop this is going to be a question for you how will changing technology in the fuels we use to generate electricity and run our cars affect where and how we grow? Let me, um, good evening everyone. Let, let me talk about, let's talk about energy for a few minutes. All right. Okay, energy, wealth, freedom, right? So energy has a direct tie to GDP. There's a one-for-one -one correlation across the globe for the amount of energy consumption per person to a per capita economic value. That leads to that that leads to wealth. And not because energy is GDP consumption, but because of the physics term work, right? We can we can transport things, we can transfer things, we can produce goods and services as a result of energy consumption. That in turn drives prosperity. Prosperity is a result of the wealth and the energy that you have. You don't have to go gather wood for a warm shower. You don't have to gather water for drinking. That prosperity is a result of time and freedom that we give back to you about your day. You can cool your room. You can take a warm shower. You can live your life. You can pursue innovation and entrepreneurial things as a result of that energy always being there. So that was my stump speech. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the changing grid. Right? Emerging technologies. EVs, I don't know if you saw the parking lot, there's a Tesla out there, there's a Volt. The, the EVs are coming. And they're going to be reliable and capable. There's still some in their infancy, but you're going to see more and more manufacturers putting those things out. That's going to be a thing that you're going to need to get your heads around. And, and I'm here to help you 
um, educate and engage with you on any questions you may have. Remember, Lake Electric's your trusted energy advisor. That, mm -hmm. That's what I'm here. I want us all to be prosperous. I, I want all that for everyone. So the, the changing grid, the changing technologies is still, there's a future. I'm not a crystal ball guy. As the economics make sense, as you continue to have a prosperous life, as the technologies are there for us to kind of in, embrace and utilize, that's when we do those things. I, I, want, a, I want a more carbon-free world. I, I want a better environment for my grandchildren. It's a matter of coupling that balance we've been talking about all night with the economics and the value proposition for you, along with when the technology mm -hmm. is, is right. So it's another one of those balances that we got to continue to work on. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Ralston talked about the real issue of having to drive to get to work on roads that are not carefully cultured. I, I don't know if that's the right word in that term, but you understand what I mean. So I am thinking that the same would be true, that we're building, but the uh, technology, the electrical capabilities are not in place to be able to, to address the level of, of, of where we're going. So we could all be carbon free tomorrow. Um, hmm. You just got to pull your checkbooks out. So that's my point. It's a, we can do it. Um, it's just the matter of amount of money you want to spend doing it. So um, it, 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 it's not all ready for prime time if you consider economics around it. And my job, first and foremost, is affordable for everyone here. And if that's, if that's what we're going for, the technology gets in, embraced when it becomes as economic as it is in value add. So that's the balance between the two. That's the balance. When I moved to Lakeland in the 80s, I remember the downtown area, and I also remember how at 5 p.m. downtown became a very still and a very quiet place. If you've lived here that long, you will also remember. So let's talk about those plans to bring more density to central Lakeland downtown area. We, we have seen a lot more development of apartments. There are plans for many more, but most of them are aimed at higher income residents. Will Lakeland attract more uh, or enough high income renters to fill these apartments? Are we pushing middle income people out to the fringes where they stay reliant on cars for transportation while we work on a walkable and bikeable center city? Mr. Maxey, you have had to do a lot of work with diversity and uh, in, in, the, in the college setting, and, and you've, you've worked a lot in this area. How would you address that? Are we, in fact, and I know when it comes to maybe, maybe getting employers, we're going to have to go back and talk with Ms. Sarah here, but it, 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 are, we, are we creating diversity, would you say, in how we're drawing people to the Lakeland area? I think we are thinking about creating diversity. I don't know if we're there yet. And part of what uh, we haven't done, in my opinion, is look far enough down the road in how we grow. Because mm -hmm. typically, right now, we're talking about the next 10, 15, 20 years. And in order to develop appropriately, we need to be thinking about the next 50 or 100 years and what we can do in that time span to make things better. Now, how it affects people in different communities, there is going to be an impact to people who don't have money. Because in every city, living in the core is more expensive. Mm -hmm. And the issue to me is not whether they can live downtown, but whether they can live in a safe and comfortable community uh, based on the amount of money they can make. Now, we are attracting companies that are bringing in high wages uh, my last couple of years at Poly, we brought in Molecule, which is a $100 million company based in San Francisco. And last year, we brought in um, the IFF, the International Flavors and Fragrances, which is a $5 billion company, to our community. So people will come, companies will come, and the issue is how do we address their need because they are going to want to have mm -hmm. some of the amenities that you might find in an Orlando or a Tampa, and at the same time, we provide housing and opportunities for people who are on the lower economic 
end of, um, of living here. Thank you so much. So, um, Sarah, we have to ask, you know, will, will Lakeland be able to attract enough high-income renters to fill these apartments? I think one of the things we haven't talked about yet is education. And I think our public school system, for all of its strengths, we still have a lot of weaknesses. Until we can all wrap around our public school system and support them and really build a framework so people who do have higher educations and high-skill, high-wage professionals want to come here, bring their families here, have their families be in school here quickly and not be on a waiting list for a charter, not be on a waiting list for a magnet school, but have accessibility to quality education. I think, again, our public school system does really, really well, but I also think that's a place in the community where we need to strengthen as much as possible as volunteers and as community leaders. But that draws people. If you look at Lakeland Regional Medical Center or Lakeland Regional mm -hmm. Health and their graduate medical assistant or education program that is coming um, down the pike, which means that we would have interns, so primary care doctors think about those types of internships at our local hospital. Where are they going to raise their families? Where are they going to put their children when they have children in school? Are they going to continue to live in Orlando or Tampa, commute in, mm -hmm. be on I-4 with the other 190,000 people that travel east and west and on I-4 every single day? We have a transportation planning organization meeting on Thursday, and I just saw that statistic this afternoon. That's just I-4 east and west every day. So are we going to have people utilizing our resources during the day and then leaving in the evenings and not having a sense of community because their families can't be here? And to Mr. Ralston's point, they can't be engaged in the school that their children's in. So their children are in and attending. So I think that's a critical component of this and of how we can really make sure that Lakeland is not only a place we all want to be, but that it is a place for every social socioeconomic mm -hmm person on the spectrum can be here too and they can have their children have a great education in the public school system that they can have great jobs and that they can have a great future that lies before them but that's one of the key components I think to this discussion as well absolutely um, Carol you've been in the healthcare uh, landscape for for many many years and the landscape I'm sure looks vastly different than it did in the in the 90s the 80s so with the legislator deregulating hospital growth and several private and nonprofit hospital groups uh, have either started building facilities in Lakeland or buying land for future growth what will this mean for healthcare delivery and what it does or bodes for the future of health in, 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 in Lakeland thank you back in 2018 the Department of Health and Human Resources um, issued a report called <clears throat> Reforming America's Health System Through Choice and Competition. And the federal government encouraged states to repeal certificate of need laws. Is everybody familiar with certificate of need? No, okay. Certificate of need meant that if you wanted to build a new hospital, build a new nursing home, add beds to your hospital. You had to apply to the Agency for Healthcare Administration for a certificate of need. And you had to demonstrate the need. But it wasn't just, for instance, in Lakeland. If Lakeland Regional wanted to add beds or change their bed count, they would have to show that there was a need in what was called a specific geographic area called a fixed need pool. So it encompassed more than likely, it actually encompassed more than Polk County at the time when it was in existence. And CON has been in existence, was in existence for 50 years. And the thought behind CON was that it would reduce health care cost and it would improve quality of care and it would improve patient access. Well, that's Has not what that happened. happened. That is not what happened. What it did was, and it would also reduce duplication of services. It increased cost because mm. you had monopolies in certain areas. It also limited patient access, particularly it showed racial disparity. And it, it did not improve the quality of care. We have a single hospital here in Lakeland at the present time. And in 
the measurement of quality, there are some, some particular, um, for instance, the federal government does a star system called CMS Compare. Lakeland is a one-star hospital on a five-star basis. On LeapFrog, which is another um, type of agency that measures quality, it's a C hospital. In communities that have multiple hospitals, you see more A hospitals, you see more four-star hospitals. So as you bring in competition, we will see Lakeland Regional will improve their quality of care because they're gonna have to compete with the other hospitals that come into town. They've got some time before we actually have additional hospital beds. And there will be a need. There was some question about whether or not the need assessment <clears throat> that Orlando Health did was based on the beds being so heavily utilized by COVID. But they actually presented, I had looked this up, they submitted their application in March of 2020. Mm. <clears throat> there was no COVID impact at that time. So we will have the need for those additional beds in the community. There still are restrictions on certificate of need for um, some specific areas like nursing homes and hospice, but we may see those go away also for the same reasons. Well, it, since, since the study shows that where there is competition, there is increase in care or in quality of care, what has been the drawback uh, for this long in that we have had one hospital in Lakeland for many years? The CON, the Certificate of Need. And once, huh. remember, Certificate of Need did not get repealed and become effective as a repealed um, law until July 1st of 2019. So there was only a few months and, and before COVID came and nothing happened. But I will tell you, HCA had tried to come into this community 40 years ago. They originally were the ones who tried to um, buy Lakeland Regional from the city. And that's when the not-for-profit corporation was formed that manages Lakeland Regional. And then they tried to go on the south side, but CON prevented them from doing it. So hospitals have tried to come in, mm. but the certificate of need laws have prevented that. So it looks like, yes. I do. I do think there's an unintended consequence of certificate of need going away because I think when you look at Orlando Regional, so for those of you, um, one of the things as sitting as a city commissioner is I'm basically a jack of all trades and a master of none, <laughs> right? Like I know enough information to be dangerous on a lot of different topics. However, on the certificate of need, for instance, when that went away and Orlando Regional Health was approved to come south of the parkway and have, you know, a presence there, which it'll be, um, I'm looking at Mr. Ruiz. It's going to be near the Sands area, basically, just <clears throat> south of the parkway. That'll be Orlando Regional Health. Well, Orlando Regional Health does not have to provide indigent health care services. Lakeland Regional will continue to provide indigent health care services. So you can't afford to go to the hospital. You can only really go to Lakeland Regional. Right. And then what will happen is there will be funding streams, and there will be, and this is what I asked the Orlando Regional Health people when I voted against them building their hospital south of the parkway was tell me what your service lines are gonna be. So what are the most profitable service lines? Cardiac, diabetes, pediatrics are not, you don't make profit on pediatric healthcare, ever. It's just, it's sort of a just basic line, you know, that goes across. So a lot of these, one of the hesitations in, although competition always breeds better quality of care and better quality of service in any industry, and I agree with that. I also think we have to be hesitant and very careful to understand that when these service lines come into other hospitals like an HCA or an Advent or an Orlando Regional Health, they can make money, even though they're nonprofits as well sometimes, they'll be making money because they'll take all the cardiac care victims that are on the south side of the community, which in turn pushes more people who had injured health care and inequities to come to Lakeland Regional, which that takes more care and more money to do. So it's not as, it's not as simple as, no. you know, it's going to breed quality and it's going to breed um, competition so well. If you look at Tampa General Hospital over in Tampa, uh, volume does drive quality. So the volume of, 
you know, harsh emergency room visits that they have at Tampa General. That's why they're such a great trauma center, right? They have a graduate medical assist, uh, education program. They have lots and lots of interns that learn through USF Health how to be doctors. So quality drives, volume drives quality in the healthcare industry. But I just want to be very careful that when we're sitting at City Commission and looking at this growth, that we have to consider things like Mrs. Phillipson is talking about. And we have to consider the cross, the, every side of it. That it can't just be, yes, it's going to breed you know, better health service, which we hope it does, taking away the CON, that's the goal, right? But we can't guarantee that. It might still put an onus of indigent healthcare on one site and not on those other sites, so that is not shared across the whole area, and you're still continuing to have some inequity. All right, Sarah, I think uh, Carol wants to address. Yes. yes, she does. Any hospital that takes Medicare or Medicaid is required to provide indigent health care services. They can't just serve the private patients, the insured patients. They are required, so Orlando Health will have to take indigent care patients. This, this seems like it's going to be a continuing conversation, right? <laughs> we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna take the gloves, well, no, but we're gonna move on a little. So, did a little bit of um, research, and what I found, um, Barry, that cities that have been effective at addressing the issue of smart growth has a template that looks like this. They preserve open space, natural beauty, and critical environmental cares. So I would like, um, maybe Mr. Ruiz, if you would, sir, explain the benefits of that approach or maybe discuss your approach and does this reflect any of the plan that might be in place for Lakeland? Well, I'm glad you didn't save a, a hard one for me. <laughs> um, the, the city commission and staff recently won three awards from the American Planning Association for the 2020 to 2030 comprehensive plan. Uh, and our comprehensive plan has a conservation element in it. Mm -hmm. and, and so our, our staff, again, balancing the interests of the developers and the public that we serve, asks the commission to designate certain lands as conservation and limited development so that developers can't develop much, I would say. The, 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 the conservation uh, zoning district allows for some development in some cases, mm -hmm. but, but doesn't allow unfettered development that would be in traditional zoning districts. So uh, we hear about environmental concerns a lot, and we work, to, to Mr. Lunds's point, we work with developers and their design professionals and their, uh, their experts mm -hmm. to mitigate against sort of disproportionate environmental impacts. And they also have to work with other state agencies that are charged with protecting those natural resources. So uh, there, there's a lot of checks and balances involved in, in protecting those precious resources. Uh, I'm confident that they are appropriate, but, but that, that, that's in the eye of the beholder for well, one project to the next. Well, I guess I shall ask Mr. Ralston if he considers this to be appropriate, the, the amount of care or attention being given to protecting critical environmental space. No, I, I think it's very important. Um, you know, what, one of the issues, though, you have to consider when you go to buy anything, you get to the checkout counter and you got to pay. And um, so thing, it costs, uh, you know, the additional uh, infrastructure improvements, those are burdens that are just added to the cost. At the moment, the median, according to Florida Realtors, the median residential single family home uh, in August in uh, median price in Polk County was 340,000. In Orange County, it's 425,000. Well, unfortunately, because interest rates are going up, uh, you know, call your congressman, um, at six and a quarter, 30 year amortization, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac underwriting, that means in order to qualify for the median price home in Polk County, you gotta make $67,000 a year. Well, the, the problem at the moment is that in uh, Polk County, the median household income is only about 51,000. 
So, you know, we, we've got a gap there of affordability. It's mm -hmm. going to create more apartments. You don't have to qualify for rent on an apartment. And I think there should be increased sensitivity on how to do things to make it more affordable. Mm -hmm. That's lower interest rates and um, although uh, and Mr. Ruiz wouldn't like it, sometimes that may mean smaller lots. So who knows? Mm. Well, I'm giving him an opportunity to answer that. Oh, and, 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 and lot, lot size and density are not about what I like. Okay. It's about what the people like and whether they're willing to live next door to a 40-foot lot mm -hmm. that is more affordable. And you may get to an affordability question shortly, so maybe I won't hijack it. Well, well you know, I'm, I'm going to ask this. The, the, many people, including families and older residents, are being priced out of the housing market. We talked about the interest rate. We talk about the, 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 the price of, of housing. How can we help to ensure that single moms or blue-collar workers and retired people on a fixed income have affordable and safe places to live? Yes. Okay. So, well, and, and I don't have my, my favorite slide with me, but it, it is a graphic of housing affordability. And that is that we don't just attack affordable housing in terms of housing cost. To Commissioner McCarley's point, housing becomes more affordable as people make more income. To Gary's point, we raise incomes, we increase affordability. That doesn't mean there isn't still a place for incentivized affordable housing, but there is not a state or local government in our nation that has the resources mm -hmm. to manipulate the market to get the rents low enough for the very poorest among us to be able to find safe, affordable housing. So we continue to chip away at it in both counts, mm -hmm. incomes and, mm -hmm. and cost. We talk about market rates, you know, we want market rates. We want a free market that, that people you know, can afford, mm -hmm. but that's a sign of prosperity. To Scott's point from earlier is the better that our, our, our community does, the better the developers and the business owners and everyone does, you know, rising tide and ships and all that. M Mr. Maxey. Uh, this brings up a, a point <clears throat> that is really close to my heart and there are a lot of people in our community who can afford medium priced houses. And I, to me, the, the fact that it's 340 or whatever it is, is not the key issue, is how are we distributing uh, jobs and income so that more people have the wherewithal to purchase those higher priced houses. And if you look at companies in this area, and I've talked to a lot of companies, economic development was one of the things I did at Florida Poly. And when I talk to employers and we talk about their workforce makeup from a demographic perspective, it becomes really obvious that the majority of the higher paying jobs go to the majority population. And when we've asked about that, you get all kinds of, of responses about what we see as barriers, they see as hmm. uh, <clears throat> things that help to make decisions. They'll use entry exams. Yeah. And as well, we don't have more managers that are not in the majority because we have an interest exam. So what are you saying? What you're saying is, well, we think that the majority population is better intellectually. And I've had people tell me that, better intellectual than people who are not in the majority population. So I think the issue becomes more than what the market is. The issue becomes how are we treating people and what are we doing to help people be in those positions so that they can earn the money to afford the houses that we have. Sarah, this sounds like a your question to Mr. Maxis. What, what are we doing to attract more? Your question in there, Rick. Um, <laughs> well, I think, you know, from an economic standpoint, I think Lakeland is doing a really good job currently at, at building its own entrepreneurs. When you look at places like here at The Well um, with Dr. Sally Stone, or you look at Catapult, or you look at Katie Lake's office and more, and you look at these different places that are launching businesses are being sites for individual entrepreneurs 
to have their own, um, you know, what they're passionate about, what they want to put out into the community, and how they want to provide for themselves and their families. So I think Lakeland has a wonderful ecosystem right now for individual businesses and for small businesses to grow and launch and become bigger and bigger. I also think that we're very appealing for big corporations to come in because we do have Florida Poly, we do have Florida Southern College and Southeastern University. So I think that you know, we are ripe for more people to come in and build the economies. I think what needs to happen is there needs to be a very straight, honest approach mm -hmm. when we are drawing those economic um, yes. interest into our community. So when we look at the Lakeland Chamber or we look at the Lakeland Economic Development Council, we want to have, or even the city of Lakeland, you know, are we being honest and forthright about what we can provide for these different businesses and industries to come in? You know, we have to pivot. We are historically an agricultural county. Yeah. And we have got to pivot and embrace new technologies, which I think we're doing, and I think we're doing it really well, and I think our academies through the public school system are giving students opportunities to not necessarily think they have to go get a bachelor's degree to have a full and prosperous life. You know, we're giving more opportunities in VoTech, and we're encouraging them to build their own businesses. So I think that it's really important that it's a, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and if there was a silver bullet to fix this, we would not be sitting here talking about it. It takes every discipline and every different person in the community to help build an environment that is welcoming, that is honest, and that also provides opportunity for everybody, regardless of where they land on the scale of socioeconomics or background or culture or religion or anything else. My, my son graduated um, from university in, in, in Fort Myers. Uh, he went to FGCU. And when he did, uh, I don't know why I thought he was coming back home, Lakeland. And he said, no, 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 I love it here, and there are opportunities here. And, there, and he stayed there, and he's been there. And so we're training a lot of young people. We're providing education at, at, at our several colleges and universities in the area. Are we doing enough to retain those individuals? Uh, because that, that, is, that, is, that is, I think, a part of attracting the high skill and high wage. Uh, but yes, sir. I was just going to comment. <clears throat> I, I hope that we have a student at Florida Poly right now who's going to invent a new video game and become a billionaire. Yes. And hopefully they'll come and visit us. But so how do students from Florida Poly get to come downtown and kind of hang out at uh, the joinery or something? How? Yeah. If, yeah if, how do they do that? Yeah. That's a difficult question. At one point we had an agreement with Citrus Connection where they had a regular route between the university and downtown. Uh, for a variety of reasons, that didn't work out. The university also established its own bus system, uh, and that bus system uh, has been trying to get students downtown, uh, but typically it gets them to the outer fringes where they live in apartments, back and forth to campus. Now, there's another part of this, too, because a lot of the African-American students are afraid to go downtown uh, because they don't think they're wanted. And I actually had them say that to me, and I asked them if they would say that same thing to Randy Avent, who's the president, uh, and they had that conversation with him. He shared it with our mayor. Uh, and we started working on ways to get students who are afraid that they aren't wanted into the community and started taking them downtown and eating at the restaurants, hanging out in the park. And what that does is they start introducing themselves and meeting people mm -hmm. who are members of the community. They become more comfortable with the community. The community becomes more comfortable with them. Mm -hmm. And that's how we build uh, a stronger, yes. cohesive community with everybody. The other thing I, I like to say too, though, is on the issue that Sarah brought up where we talk about building um, the economy here with smaller companies and giving them an opportunity to grow. Uh, uh, Brian and I, Carol and Sarah has been a part of this as well. We're working with employers, large employers, small employers, and minority employers, women, to uh, make them more successful in Lakeland. And Good. a major part of that is having them get opportunities to get contracts for providing services and products. So employers here, large employers here, are behind us on that. We're now working through the implementation 
of how we do that. But it's going to be important because you, when you do that, when those companies grow, they hire people. That's more money going into communities. That's more mm -hmm. money going into the development of the city of Lakeland or the, the area of Lakeland. And we can't get there unless everybody gets there. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see the attendance here tonight. And I'm trusting that as we sit and as we have this conversation, I sh that though, you know, we're all up involved in this. We're all stakeholders in this issue, and we all have a part to play in this issue. Um, I, I, I have some questions from the audience, right, Trinity? Are we, are we gonna, we, we have, we, I think some were sent in earlier, but I wanted to ask something that I know is very near and dear to Barry's heart, and it's about the developments and buildings that have gone, gone up in our historic areas. What can we do to ensure that they match the existing aesthetic, Mr. Lunds? So that's a, the way you phrase it, to match the existing aesthetic. Um, I, I did my undergrad and grad studies at Savannah College of Art and Design. And if you want a laboratory of growth and understanding of uh, 1700s through 19th to 20th century, it's like looking at the Grand Canyon of architecture. Because styles change over time. Uh, technology changes, delivery changes. So it is about appropriateness. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the historic board, and I, I served six years, uh, three I think with John White who's sitting here, uh, and then chaired it for two, you apply for a certificate of appropriateness. It is about mass, it is about scale, it's about how reasonable it looks. It's not, does it look like a period piece that Frank Lloyd Wright did? Because that's replication, that's not honesty. There has to be authenticity to the design itself. There's an integrity to the building, and it has to meet the building techniques that we know right now. To replicate what we did 100 years ago is near impossible to do at the scale that's cost, uh, again, affordable. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? How, we don't put something that's uh, four blocks. We respect the bungalow. We respect, because our historic districts aren't the individual. Our historic districts are on the historic register because of the district. Whether it's the post-war development that occurs in Lake Hunter, whether it's the, uh, uh, the early 1900s in Lake Morton South, if it's Lake Morton East, each district is about the rhythm. Yeah. And it's like a smile. You lose a tooth, the smile isn't pretty. So we wanna make sure that that's consistent, that it looks well, and it is appropriate. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to move to some questions from uh, the, uh, our uh, if they saw readers. Okay, I was wondering if they were coming in as we were speaking. And then we're going to move to some questions from the audience. Marcia C. asks, can anything be done about constant delays because of airport railroad crossing? In the last month, it's a delay no matter what time of day. My last delay was 35 minutes, she says. When you have a doctor's appointment, it is serious to you. Who, who, who would love to tackle that? <laughs> you know, nobody wants to talk about this. Yeah, I, 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 I told Chuck I was not going to Aren't ask you glad him you to don't bail have to me out tonight. I, I have a phone a friend in the audience. Um, <laughs> for, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the the railroad industry, CSX specifically, they were here before pretty well every other form of transportation except horseback. And so they have what I would consider to be extreme federal protections. Mm. In order for us to get much of anything from CSX, we have to ask very, very nicely, repeatedly, and hope that they find the grace to grant our request. And, and I'm, so, sure, I'm sure it's probably not that we don't want CSX to come through. I have seen CSX with the long carriages behind them, like at, during drive time, when people are trying to get to work, from work, and on lunch. So is, is there a way to make the acts more specific like to times of day? There, there is, and we ask, and they say no frequently. <laughs> Uh, well. what, what I would speak to, though, is the importance of our grid, and that is that you are not trapped 
on a single arterial or collector roadway when a long train comes through, that you have options. There are a few places in town, this airport road example is probably a decent one, where your only option is to make a U-turn and go back the way you came. But uh, just as Commissioner McCarley mentioned, some of the West Pipkin Road area where Medulla has been extended down to Yule, we're working on the South Wabash extension. All of these connections relieve the pressure at other places, particularly when a long train comes through, uh, but, at, but at other hours of peak uh, motorist activity. So w we'll ask, I'm sure Chuck has made a mental note, he never forgets anything, uh, about this particular CSX concern. Mm -hmm. I'm not optimistic that they will make much, if any, change as a result, uh, but that's why we have to build in as many transportation options and connections and, and, and make sure that grid is as complete as it can be. Mr. Ralston, your job is cut out for you, it seems. <laughs> it seems. Well, okay, so the last question uh, coming from our reader. Uh, with all the development that has occurred in Lakeland in recent years, is it too late for smart growth to happen? You know that's you. <laughs> I, I don't think it's ever too late for smart growth to happen. I think that... Um, I think that we've grown exponentially, but I also think that it's imperative when I teach civic education to the Randy Roberts Foundation scholars that I work with through congressional classroom and community classroom, we talk a lot about process. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's really critical for our, the people of Lakeland to know in any community in our 17 municipal area, 17 municipalities that we have throughout Polk County is that there is a process. So we'll, when something comes before the city commission after it's been at planning and zoning, and the planning and zoning board is made up of citizens who sign up to volunteer and participate in that, and it's a lot of meetings as well, just like the commission, and we'd love to have people involved. Once it passes planning and zoning and comes to the city commission, and I'm talking about a development, a new store, a hospital, you know, something like that comes before them, then it'll come to com city commission and there is a first reading. And so at the very first reading, there is no public comment. It's a first reading that we want to build a new barn on Highway X near the CSX railroad track, right? Like I'm just using that as a crazy example. But at the first reading, it'll be posted and publicized on the Wednesday before our agenda study on a Friday, and then we meet the first and third Mondays of the month, and you can come and listen to what that presentation is. And Chuck will probably Thank make you. a presentation on what it looks like and what the roads look like and the con connectivity around it. At the second reading, which would be two weeks later, unless it's continued, that's where we have public comment. So you are highly encouraged to come and talk to the city commission in the public comment piece, either at the time we'll say, you know, there's a motion on the floor and there's a second. Is there any discussion between commissioners? If not, is there any discussion from the, from the audience? That is the audience's opportunity to come up on a second reading on a development plan and make a comment. Or you can wait until the end of the agenda and you can say something at that point in time. So that goes through a pretty arduous process that can last anywhere from, I'm looking at Mr. Ruiz, you know, a few awesome. months to a couple years to be really candid about it. It can get, the, you know, the can can get kicked down the road. So I think when it comes to smart growth is the engagement is really part of the community at large of you all being participating and looking at the city website and looking at the agendas twice a month to see what we're talking about. But then also understanding that something like Riverstone on the south side, southwest sector down off of Pipkin Road, that was approved in 2017 or before. 2006 or 2008. Mm. So they didn't break ground on Riverstone, which is 1,300 rooftops, until 2020, Chuck? 18. 18. And so that's a 10-year swing, right? So some of this growth that feels like it has happened overnight has been on the docket, has been presented since the early 2000s. It's just that it's all kind of happening at once, but it has existed in the city of Lakeland's planning and zoning, and, and developers have come to the, to the city to ask for these approvals and such. It's just taken a long time, an arduous time to make it happen. So it feels, like, I know it feels like a lot, and it is a lot, but it's been going on for, for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. So I think there's always time for smart growth, and I think it, but it is contingent upon the community of you all being engaged tonight and continuing to be engaged in the city at large. And we appreciate this kind of outpouring and connectivity and, and relationship with you guys in this discussion. Thank you. Yes, yes, Mr. Yes. 
One, one other data point to add, just as you all may or may not be aware, um, the Census Bureau numbers came out, some people did some refinements for the algorithms, but based on the last year, Polk County, the Lakeland Winter Haven Metropolitan Statistical Area, as I said, is the fourth fastest growing metro in the United States. We're growing by 64 people a day. And so I think we need to consider how do we welcome these people? How do we get them part of the family and use that to increase our quality of life? Absolutely. At this time, we would like to open the questions from the audience. And I am sure that after this very spirited uh, and lively conversation that you have uh, a lot of questions yourself. Trinity is going to be coming around with a microphone and um, there you go. Right. We, we just raised raise of the hand and we have two. Oh, three. Well, three at this point. But. I saw Brett first, so I'll go over here. Um, my, my question, I've got one about Lakeland Electric. Oh, I've got one about Lakeland Electric. So I was wondering, are you considering doing, I mean, I, I've been talking to a lot of people on Facebook. It seems like nobody can afford the electric now. The electric has just gotten mm. so high. People are a couple months behind, things like that. Is Lakeland Electric considering possibly doing rooftop solar and giving grants for rooftop solar? And also, are they doing anything for battery capacity for any net metering that comes from that? If, if you're going to do solar at the house, you absolutely have to have battery. I mean, it, it, Elon Musk apologized to the public for selling solar systems to people without batteries on them. He, he flat out, you have to have battery capabilities. The, the increase in fuel rate that happened that, that's kind of pinching people right now is 100% a pass-through cost for us. We don't control the cost of fuel globally. We, we just don't do it. We, we purchase off the market just like everyone else does. So as those rates went up, that's a pass-through cost for us. All we did was trying to cover our costs for fuel. You go to the pump now, everything's more expensive. I mean, I feel you. We, we do have Project Care and some opportunities out there for folks where they can get resources to kind of help them along in the burden. I, I, I pay a power bill here too. So I know um, and I feel it. So should more solar be adopted? Does that solve all your problem and make your power bill cheaper? Yes, but then you got to pay for the cost of the capital mm. of the actual solar installation. It's about a 10 or 15 year return, but who has the capital dollars to do that? Getting federal dollars, getting state dollars to try to cover some of those costs. There are tax incentives and rebates you can apply for. Um, we don't, we're not in the tax game. So it doesn't behoove us to grab those things and then turn around and get a tax benefit from them. That's just not how we play. We, but I hear you. So if we lose, yes, if we use less fuel, then I don't have to pass that on to you. So now I got to get now we got to get the capital outlay for everyone to do that in order for that to happen. Right behind you, Trinity. Oh, there was. Oh, sorry. Didn't realize there was something. Hi, my name is Sharon Smyers. I'm a resident in the Northwest District. Um, transportation. A couple of things on transportation, and then I did just want to bring attention to. One other issue, which I will just say, I don't know if anybody's equipped to it, stormwater on the west side of Lakeland um, is a massive issue, and it seems like it's just dumping out west with nowhere to go. So I don't know if that's on the charts, but after, particularly after this hurricane, there's a massive stormwater issue in west Lakeland. The other on the road system, number one, it, yes? Could, could you narrow west Lakeland? I mean, are we oh, Memorial Boulevard. So Memorial out Memorial towards Long Palm I4, and Kathleen around, High School? Yep, okay. around the I-4 area, yep. And the new Tampa Highway. And it just smells, you can't even believe the smell, the old Tampa Highway, the smell is just unbelievable right now, standing mm. water. The other is on the road system. Obviously the road diet, you know, the general consensus with the public is nobody's excited about it. I mean, it's, you know, I, I believe there's other solutions to the road diet. I don't know if they're, if we're just accepting this and moving forward or so the road diet and the other one is coming from West Lakeland right on the west side of St. Joe's where it's a one-way road northbound with a bike lane 
I've been crossing that road for decades and I have never seen a car or a push bike. So they're my two questions. Okay, well, I thought Scott was gonna have the toughest one with uh, elect, uh, uh, fuel rates and, and electric rates, uh, the road diet. So the, we are, the DOT has completed the test period. The city commission has now scheduled a workshop with, with uh, District 1, FDOT staff, our own staff, and I believe the DOT's consultant for December the 2nd. They will hear a presentation from us collectively and will discuss, I'm sure, amongst themselves and provide the staff, DOT and city, with direction as to what to bring back to them. So at the beginning of the project or before the test, the city commission at that time, Commissioner McCarley was not on it, take it easy on it, <laughs> passed, passed a resolution after decades of angst over the performance of that corridor, passed a resolution asking the DOT to pilot the road diet. So on the back end now, after that workshop where we will hear from the commission, what do you think about the success of that test? We will bring back to them a resolution based on that feedback that in lay terms says, yes, the test was a success, or no, the test was a complete failure. Because though the commission will have the opportunity, and, and even without it, I'm sure it would take the opportunity to communicate their preferences for the ultimate design and construction of that corridor to the DOT, the only thing the DOT is officially asking our commission to do is to chime in on the success of the test. So three lanes, or not, and if they vote not, even though they'll bring lots of input and suggestion, the DOT is not bound by any of it. And mm. so then District 1 will set about deciding, so not three lanes, what? And they have their own process for seeing that happen. It involves the public, but not the city quite as much. Um, so December 2nd, mark your calendar. It'll be live streamed. Uh, generally at workshops, the public is not invited to provide input, so everyone's welcome to watch. The resolution that follows that will be advertised like everything else on city commission agendas, and I'm sure they'll get lots of social media play out of it as well. One question, where did that data come from? Well, the DOT's consultant has collected tons and tons and tons of data from not only the corridor, on safety and travel times and we uh, the commission asked or, or blessed the DOT's request to extend the test period because of the COVID-19 pandemic which happened less than a year after the test was started and just completely skewed any type of apples to apples comparison on on not only volume but speed so they've got the crash data, they've got the speed data. We know how long it takes uh, motorists to pass through the corridor, both, both from, uh, what can I think, Lyme to Ariana, but also from Maine to Edgewood. So we, the, the DOT has measured the travel time and the difference pre and, and post, or pre-test and through the test, um, and then our own traffic operations division in, in, at the city has also gathered Bluetooth sensor data from side streets. So all the neighbor, not all the neighborhood, but several of the neighborhood streets, Missouri, Success, South Boulevard, have also got traffic counts over a significant period of time that, that will become a part of that presentation to the commission. We also have the DOT's consultant did a fairly extensive MetroQuest survey and yes, we got about two thirds response were not favorable for the current condition, and, but about a third were. We had the public uh, workshop at the RP Funding Center on July 11th and had about 125 attendees at that who provided input not only to the DOT and the city staff, but also to elected officials who attended uh, and the district secretary was there as well. All right, Brian, I'm gonna let you off the hot seat. <laughs> We have one more question over here. 
I got several. <laughs> okay, so I'm, my name is Marsha. I live in the north side of Lakeland, over by Carlton Arms. So my first question is for the electricity guy. Um, <laughs> on Williamstown, every time there's a major storm, the electricity goes out. Yet my same development in another area on egress has their electricity all the time. And I'm being told by the property manager that it's two different grids. How do hmm. we get Williamstown on the other grid so when I have a sleep apnea machine running, I don't have, because I like, when I lived in South Florida, FPL would say, if you have a condition, let us know, you're, you're the first one to get electricity back. And when I call Lakeland, they're like, so sorry, we don't have that plan. That's my first one. So, two questions, did I get two questions? That the first one is, we're, I'm on a circuit that's different from the neighborhood next to me. I seem to go out all the time. It's the same development. It's just different. Different phases. Different phases. Oh, and it's all overhead lines back there? I wish I could hmm. say to God which circuits he takes out of each time, but he kind of picks. Um, we, we do maintenance on the lines. We, we try to make sure all of our lines are managed the same way. Who goes out in a storm? Is there any way of putting those lines underground then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a quick answer. Bring, bring out your checkbook. No, no, so we are, okay, so we are, storm resiliency and hardening, hardening is real important to us, right? So as we recover on asset after a 30 year, we look back at putting those back underground. I mean, it's a, it's a part of the whole plan eventually, right? But it's expensive. So we take X amount of capital every, every year and we choose to do lines that we can. Um, as far as the medical necessity of your sleep apnea machine, um, we're a silver city. Um, I, 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 wish, I wish I could say we do prioritize circuits for safety, LPD, fire departments, critical care facilities, hospitals. We, we, we do all that, right? Your best bet's to move next to the hospital. Um, but, but we, so we, we, do, we do restore two critical facilities first. Beyond that, it's, we go after bang for our buck. We try to find the biggest outages and go after those next to get the most people on in the quickest amount of time. So that's how we recovered on that hurricane too. Like one, once, once we get the core facilities up, then it's a matter of where are our larger outages, where can I send resources to get the people on as fast as I can. So it's, it's not a onesie twosie. Mm -hmm. I, I, wish, I wish we could do that. I don't have the resources to pull that off. So I'm sorry, but we're coming out yeah. of time. So hopefully you can follow up maybe yeah. Yeah. after. Um, I do have one more question from the audience that was submitted. Um, that's one more general question. Um, do we ask potential employees how they can help with opportunities for, for lower, lower socioeconomic jobs and training, not just the high paying jobs? Employers is what it says. It says, do we ask potential employers how they can help with opportunities for lower socioeconomic jobs and training? So I think essentially, like, you know, we've talked about recruiting high paying, high wage jobs, but are we making sure that there are enough tiers for mobility that are built into those jobs that are coming? Um, and I know there have been, I mean, there have been some questions too about the Amazon warehouse and the jobs that are creating there and whether those are long term stable jobs or are they simply going to be replaced by robotics in the future years? So when we give these incentives, or we are trying to attract employers here, are we making sure that there are essentially tiers and levels within that, those, um, those employment opportunities? I can tell you that when we talk to uh, potential employers coming to Polk, we don't talk much about the tiers because that's an operational issue with the company. So I can't say to them, you need to have a, a job path that has seven tiers so people have mobility. We can't do that. 
uh, but we do talk about the, the training that they provide so that they can get as many of their employees from this area as they can. And there is also uh, support from Career Source Polk and from the state of Florida to help train and retrain people for jobs that we're bringing into uh, the county and the city. And so there, there's not the, what I'm hearing, the structure, but there is support for getting people prepared to take those jobs and to get them retrained. They actually get incentives or, or direct pay for retraining people who may have been pushed out of a job because of technology or some mm -hmm. other reason. Um, I do know that there is going to be a second section to this evening's uh, gathering. And so at this time, I think I'd like to thank the panelists for being here. I think we can do a round of applause. You guys were wonderful and, and handled each question with such clarity, we really appreciate it. At this time, I think maybe a 15 minute break. Um, so actually we're gonna take maybe a 10 minute break if we can to reset the room. We've got some snacks in the back behind Laura. So a little intermission, if you will. And then after that, we're really gonna like switch gears. And instead of us talking to you, we want you to talk to us. Mm -hmm. We have facilitators from the Lakeland Vision Board that are gonna be hosting small group tables and really trying to have the conversation to get the community's feedback at this time. So we really hope that you guys can stay for that. Um, in the meantime, get up, stretch your legs, get some water, get some snacks in the back. But before you do, I just want to give a round of applause for our moderator, Andrea Oliver. Thank you so much. Does you an have been job. a wonderful audience. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And give yourselves a round of applause, too, because, again, thank you all for being here and participating in this conversation. Thank you.